Hey everyone, Daniel here from Next Level Life, and today we're going to be taking a look at a book called Subliminal, How Your Unconscious Mind Rules Your Behavior. You know, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between behavior that is willful and behavior that is habitual or automatic. Especially when we as humans often tend to believe that consciously motivated behavior is so powerful that we read consciousness into not only our own behaviors, but those of the animal kingdom as well. It's called anthropomorphizing, and we do it with our pets all the time. A common example would be when your dog barks at the mailman. Is the dog just excited to see another person, or is there something in the dog's biological constitution that makes them bark at strangers? Maybe it's some sort of protective instinct that dogs have built up over thousands of years. Now this book summary is going to be a little bit different than my last one because the basic idea of this book can be summed up pretty darn quickly. Basically, the idea is that the dog's actions are motivated by instincts as much as, if not more so, than any conscious decision making. And there are many ways that we, as humans, are subject to the same type of thing. We want to believe that our decisions are grounded in logic and reason and that they're all under our control, but the truth is there are a lot of things going on just beneath the surface that we aren't aware of, and these things distort our view of reality. That's basically the idea in a nutshell. So instead, I'm going to focus on a few of the examples in the book that I found the most interesting. Let's get started. The first idea that I want to share with you is known as the visual dominance ratio. In modern human society, there are two kinds of dominance. One is physical dominance, and the other is social dominance. Physical dominance, of course, aims to influence others through fear and aggression, but social dominance is more based on admiration. And the visual dominance ratio is a neat little trick to quickly figure out who's in charge, so to speak, in a group, pretty quickly. Here's how to find the ratio. Take the percentage of time you spend looking into someone's eyes while you're speaking to them, and divide it by the percentage of time you spend looking into that person's eyes when you're listening to them. So if you spend an equal amount of time looking into someone's eyes when you're talking to them as you do when you're listening, your ratio would be about 1 to 1. But if you look into the person's eyes more when you were speaking than when you were listening, your ratio would be greater than 1 to 1. And generally, those who have more social power, like bosses for example, have a greater than 1 to 1 ratio in this area. The second idea that I want to talk about is how to use your voice in a way that'll make you sound more credible. The pitch, timber, volume, and cadence of your voice can all affect how convincing you are, as well as how people judge your state of mind and your character. So can the speed that you speak at, and even how you modulate the pitch and volume of your voice. In several studies where scientists scrambled the recordings of people in order to make the meaning of what the people actually said impossible to understand, they found a significant difference in how people judged these so-called content-free recordings. Even though each person who was recorded said the exact same thing, since their audio was unintelligible, the way the people received it couldn't have anything to do with what was actually said, but it would still have something to do with how it was said. And it was found that those who spoke with higher pitched voices were judged to be less truthful, less empathetic, and more nervous than those who had lower voices. They also found that people who talked slower were seen as less truthful and less persuasive, and also more passive than those who talked faster. Now, of course, fast talking may be a cliched description of dozens of sleazy salesmen the world over, but chances are a little speed up in your speech will actually help you sound smarter and more convincing. As long as you don't go so fast that you start stumbling over your own words. The third and final idea that I want to share with you is known as the above average effect. There was once a study done on nearly a million high school seniors, and one of the questions asked them to judge themselves on their own ability to get along with others. Nearly 100% of them rated themselves as at least average in that category, and about 60% of them rated themselves in the top 10% of that category. And then, of course, 25% of them thought that they were in the top 1% of all those surveyed in that category. And this is something that unconsciously affects just about every one of us, from the executive that got fired for allowing revenues to plummet but still thinks they deserve that $50 million exit package, to overly optimistic stock pickers, and, and even to the 94% of college professors that say they do above-average work in a similar survey to the one I just mentioned a moment ago. And ironically, people tend to be able to see that this overconfidence can be a problem, but only in others. Yeah, we even overestimate our ability to resist overestimating our abilities. So what's going on? How can a manager that is routinely missing their numbers simultaneously convince themselves that they have the talent, but when a promotion goes to a coworker instead of them, also manage to convince themselves that it's only because the boss was somehow misguided? I think that the psychologist Jonathan Haidt said it best when he said that there are two ways of getting at the truth. The way of the scientist and the way of the lawyer. Scientists gather evidence, they look for patterns, form theories, and then test them. Lawyers begin with a conclusion that they want to convince others of, and then they look for evidence that supports it while also attempting to discredit any evidence that doesn't. 
And while on the surface, gathering evidence and then forming a belief based on that evidence seems to be the more rational choice for us to take in everyday life. But taking the lawyer path oftentimes will make you feel more happy, and the mind generally opts for the path that will make us feel more happy, even when it isn't the most rational one. And as it turns out, the brain is a decent scientist, but an absolutely outstanding lawyer. So that's subliminal, and if I were to present a brief conclusion on the summary that I gave at the start of the video, I would say this. Evolution didn't design our brains to understand itself. It was designed to help us survive. We observe ourselves and our world and make just enough sense out of everything to get along. And for some of us, including all of you that have watched this far into the video, are interested in understanding ourselves a little bit more deeply. Maybe it's to make better life decisions, or just to have a richer life now, or maybe just out of curiosity, but whatever the reason is, we're looking to get past our natural idea of ourselves. And we can. We can use our conscious mind to cut through those cognitive illusions that distort our reality and get to know ourselves better. But as we do, it'd be a good idea to maintain an appreciation of the fact that if our mind's natural view of the world is a little skewed, it's skewed for a reason. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.